Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Korea Policy Forum hosted by the GW Institute for Korean Studies. We go by GWICS here, GWIKS. Um, I'm Jisoo Kim. I'm the director of the G, uh, GW Institute for Korean Studies and also Korea Foundation Associate Professor of History, International Affairs, and East Asian Language and Literatures. Uh, we are extremely honored and delighted to have his Excellency Taeyong Cho, who is the ambassador of the Republic of Korea to the United States, joining with us at GW. Um, he, uh, I would like to uh, first begin by expressing my appreciation to Ambassador Cho for his kind support for students interested in Korea. Uh, when we, we had our first undergraduate conference uh, at GW back in uh, September, uh, at the beginning of the semester, um, and he generously invited our students who participated in the conference uh, to his residence to congratulate students who were chosen to present their research uh, here at GW. And uh, these students were not just only from GW, but across the nation, uh, from Stanford, Michigan, USC, Johns Hopkins, uh, Georgetown, and so forth. And, um, and we were very grateful uh, for his support towards these students, uh, for the next generation of young scholars in the field of Korean studies to congratulate them. Um, so, and also we are very honored um, that it, it is his first time speaking at the university, US university, any US university. And so GW is his first visit. So very honored and delighted to have him here with us and, uh, and give his lecture and also uh, meet with the GW community, especially our students. Um, we also have another honorable guest with us today, Dean Alyssa Ayers. She'll be uh, introducing Ambassador Cho and moderating the Q&A session after his talk, but I'll have the honor of introducing Dean Alyssa Ayers. Um, Dr. Ayers is the Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. She's a foreign policy practitioner and award-winning author with senior experience in the government, nonprofit, and private sectors. From 2013 to 2021, she was senior fellow for, <coughs> excuse me, India, <coughs> excuse me, Pakistan and South Asia at the Council on Foreign Affair, Foreign Relations, where she remains an adjunct senior fellow. Her work focuses primarily on India's role in the world and on U.S. Uh, relations with South Asia in the larger Indo-Pacific. And from 2010 to 2013, Dean Ayer served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia. She received an AB from Harvard College and an MA and PhD from the University of Chicago. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dean Ayers. Thank you, Professor Kim, and thank you, Ambassador Cho, for taking the time to be here with us today. And I also want to echo Professor Kim's warm welcome to you that you've selected the Elliott School for your inaugural university visit here in the United States. I know you're all waiting to hear uh, what Ambassador Cho has to say, so let me present his bio for you, and then we will be on our way. Ambassador Young Cho has been ambassador of the Republic of Korea to the United States of America since June 2022. Ambassador Cho, a career diplomat for almost four decades, joined the Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1979. During his foreign service, his primary focus was on North Korea's nuclear affairs and the ROK-US alliance, serving as both Director General for North Korean Nuclear Affairs and later as Director General for North American Affairs. At different times, he was the special advisor to the foreign minister, as well as a senior official in the office of the president. His previous foreign assignments include the United Nations, the United States, and Thailand. From 2007 to 2009, he served as ambassador of the Republic of Korea to the Republic of Ireland. After a two-year period as chief of protocol in Seoul, he became an ambassador again, this time to the Commonwealth of Australia. Following his mission in Canberra, Ambassador Cho served in a number of different senior leadership positions in the country's national security apparatus from 2013 to 2017. He served as Special Representative for Korean Peninsula Peace and Security Affairs from 2013 to 14, before becoming first Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs. He later served as first Deputy Director to the President in the Office of National Security from 2015 to 17. In May 2020, Ambassador Cho became a member of the 21st National Assembly of the Republic of Korea. There he was chair of the International Committee and vice chair of the Policy Committee of the People Power Party. This is an extremely interesting career path, so I hope somebody asks him about this. Ambassador Cho graduated from Seoul National University with a BA in political science and completed the Foreign Service Program from the University of Oxford. 
He was a visiting scholar at Keio University in Japan and a visiting professor of the Graduate School of International Studies at Yonsei University in Seoul in 2019. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Cho. Ambassador Cho. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ayers, for a very nice introduction. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's such a pleasure and honor for me to be here this afternoon and uh, trying to have some interactions about the uh, new Korean government's US policies and foreign policy in general, and also the current status and the future direction of US ROK relations. I'm very happy to share my thoughts with you. Um, I have like 20 minutes, I, I was told, to present what I think is important. And uh, I'll enjoy the Q&A sessions with you. And before that, uh, yes, my name is Cho, and uh, first name is Taeyong. I was a career diplomat for all my life. And then in 2017, I was at that time serving in the Blue House as Deputy, Deputy National Security Advisor and change of government. So I was, uh, I became a quasi columnist for the newspapers for three years and spent a year in Japan. And then I became a member of National Assembly, got exposed to the uh, some of the Korean politics, uh, you know, offered to the foreign policy, the uh, decision making and foreign policy in general. And then we had presidential elections earlier this year, and uh, my political party won, my candidate won. So I was asked to come to Washington DC as ambassador. That means that um, I became a politically neutral again. So I quit my political party. And um, I don't, so I, I, I don't, um, I don't, I'm not supposed to engage in pol political narratives here. So I speak about our policies as objectively as I can. And then I like to recognize the, uh, the important people who organize this. And first, the Dean, uh, Dr. Alisa Ers, thank you very much. And Dr. Chisu Kim over there. And Dr. Won Ho Kim, thank you very much for, for your efforts. And also Dr. Young Gi Kim, a professor emeritus of George Washington University. So um, the title given to me is Alliance at 70. So seven decades of the Alliance. ROK US Alliance, if you care to study the history of it, actually began uh, at as part of the arrangements that put an end to the Korean War. So at that time, we had uh, three very bloody years of war fighting uh, going on on the Korean Peninsula. And of course, United States uh, wanted to put a stop to the fighting, the hostilities and bloodletting, and um, try to um, end the war. And then ROK government wanted to have a a structure, an, an assurance that the North Korean invasion wouldn't happen so easily again. So after intensive uh, discussions and consultations, finally, the ROK and the United States signed the Mutual Defense Treaty in 1953. And Korean War didn't only produce the Korea-US alliance, it also produced a couple of other arrangements, including the ANZUS Treaty, so trilateral, the Alliance Treaty among Australia, New Zealand, and United States. So what I'm saying is that Korean War was a that kind of watershed moment uh, in which, or after which, the Cold War confrontation became in earnest, and US he understood that they would take a leadership role the, in, in defending and leading the free world. So that's been there for until 1989, when, as you know, Berlin Wall crumbled down and Soviet Union was disintegrated in 1990. And then we came into a new international order called post-Cold War War. And during the post-Cold War War, and somebody said that this is a, a unipolar international system, meaning as you know, United States is the only uh, powerful and meaningful 
kind of leader of the international order. I believe that this, uh, this international system uh, continued until a couple of years ago. Uh, may I say that perhaps this world was unchallenged until 2008 when the a financial crisis erupted. And then the China, especially after Xi Jinping became leader, decided to put up a fundamental challenge to the dominant position of the United States. So what I'm saying is that from 1989 up until 2008, we had one world and ROK actually prospered and de developed during those times. And then between 2008 and um, now, the, we have a different uh, world kind of enveloping or developing or evolving. And I believe that um, this is a time when the international order is actually fundamentally shifting from one we knew to the one we are probably coming to know very soon. And this new world actually, uh, I don't know what that is. We'll have to really think about it. And perhaps the academics, eminent academics will after say 10 years from now, we look back and say this, this world was actually this and that. So it's their job. I don't want to define or I don't, I don't want to come up with a conceptual, conceptual framework to describe what's going on. But what I know is that all the assumptions and the policies that many countries pursued up until 2008 or maybe up until 2013 or up until now, I think are being challenged. And every nation is on its own to trying to find what's gonna happen and what kind of policies will best serve their national interests. So this is a long way of saying that actually Alliance after seven decades is becoming more relevant, more important and perhaps crucial uh, for both nations. So that is why this relationship from our standpoint, from the from ROK, the relationship with Washington DC is I think all the more important these days, say than 10 years ago or maybe 20 years ago. So this will be the message I'd like to share with you all in all. So the Alliance is becoming more important, becoming, becoming more uh, relevant and makes sense. And also I wanna add, that actually alliance now is becoming more a balanced, becoming uh, the center of gravity within the alliance has moved a little bit to the ROK side. I'm not saying the US is not the center of gravity. They are center of gravity. What I'm saying is that because the Korean economy has prospered, many Korean companies became a important members of the supply chains of many important items, including semiconductors and electric vehicle batteries, you name it. So these relations, also the ROK's military capability also, also has been, you know, has, has strengthened. So all in all, this alliance has become more important, but this alliance has, has evolved into something more balanced between Seoul and Washington DC. So what I'm saying is that this alliance is important to our OK, but this alliance is also important in the United States. So that's the words that I like to you know, uh, share with you. So let me say a few words about, um, I covered the strategic environment and objectives already, I think. And then let's see, uh, have an overview of the relationship. It, so, um, Yes, the new Korean government's foreign policy, um, it called, we sometimes coined the strange words to describe our policies. This time we coined the word GPS, and that is global pivotal state. I didn't, I didn't coin it, somebody else coined it. <laughs> that has become a, a word, the, um, you know, symbolizing the many aspects of the new governments of President Yoon Suk-yeol's foreign policy, global pivotal state. That means that um, 
recognizing that Korean foreign policy was um, was um, kind of uh, was a prisoner of our North Korea policies for the past five years. You remember back in 2008, 9, 10, Korea produced the UN Secretary General and then Korean American, American citizen, not Korean, but Korean American actually led World Bank. And I heard from Han Ki Moon, heard from Jim Young Kim that actually they, both of them, traveled together to a number of countries. And Ban Ki Moon is trying to convince the leader of those countries that, well, it's good to have free elections. And it's good to have, uh, good, good to respect the outcome of the elections. And then Jim Young Kim, the leader, head of the World Bank, is having his words actually a suitcase full of cash <laughs> and to share this wealth with the, with the leaders of the, those countries if those countries you know, move forward in the direction of democracy, respect for human rights, and the, the, the genuine will for economic development. So at that time, actually, Korea was widely known Korean name was heard globally. What I'm saying is that for the past five years, the previous Korean government was so single-mindedly focused upon North Korea policies, and uh, the past Korean government didn't do much in terms of our contributions regionally or our, our contributions globally. So this Korean, new Korean government is trying to change that. That's why the, the word global is in there. We want to uh, play more important role regionally in the Indo-Pacific region. That's why recently we have we wrote a, our own Indo-Pacific strategy report, and also the we want to uh, play more more important roles globally. So we became part of the global fund for the uh, the the for the for the global health. The global fund, I think, is the fund designed to fight three important the epidemics, uh, including tuberculosis and um, HIV, HIV AIDS, and also I think the other one, the malaria. So uh, these are kind of things the new Korean government is interested in doing. So we want to make a, a greater contribution regionally and globally rather than being confined rather than our sites being confined on the Korean Peninsula. This is a long way, so this contribution will increase gradually, but this is the direction definitely set by the new Korean government. And the, the emphasis on greater uh, contributions and role by the new Korean government um, are consistent with the, uh, the direction of the US uh, the administration's foreign policy. So our policies sit very well with US policies. It can be, they can be mutually complementary too. So that is another reason, the one reason why the relations between ROK and US are in, in, in such a good shape. I, I can say that relations are, are very, very good, uh, in excellent shape. We have so many, um, the very high level, but at the same time, so substantive conversations on the way between our two countries. Uh, maybe some of you saw the news that we had a, another bilateral leaders meeting in, in Phnom Penh on the margins of East Asia summit. We had another trilateral uh, leadership leaders meeting in, in Phnom Penh, the US, ROK and Japan. So these are part of the efforts part of the stories that are going on uh, between ROK and the United States. We believe that um, the, our, relations, our relations are becoming, I think, more aligned. Uh, aligned is a good word, I think. So our objectives and US objectives are more aligned. And the, our emphasis and US emphasis are more aligned in terms of foreign policy. And um, that, um, that provides a generally positive environment uh, for the relationship and for my work in Washington, DC. Um, 
I want to talk about the North Korean nuclear issue, some of the, um, the responses our alliance is making afterwards. And I will talk about the, a new exciting area of cooperation called economic security. So uh, we, I can cover all this uh, during Q&A sessions. Just want to say a few words about um, ROK-Japan relations. ROK-Japan relations basically is a bilateral relation between Seoul and Tokyo, but it has a hugely impo important, hugely important implications the, on the relations between Seoul and Washington and Tokyo and Washington. So in the past five years, everybody agrees that um, ROK-Japan relations uh, came down all time low. Now we are trying to um, reinstate and restore our relations between Seoul and Tokyo, not easy. We have a very complicated legal and history problems to, to work out. And the working out those problems, I have my own experience, is, is going to be extremely difficult. It is extremely difficult to find the solution it will be even more difficult to make this solution stick and be sustained. We have had, Korea and Japan have had a number of rather important agreements and many of the agreements actually have unraveled and years after that. So my point is trying to come up with a sustainable solution to the issues of legal, legal and uh, past history will be very, very challenging. But new Korean government made it very clear that it is our own national interests to improve our relation with Tokyo. And for that, we are going to make our own diplomatic efforts to find a solution to these, to these past history issues, most important, important of which, of course, is an issue of forced labor. But while this is going on, New Korean government made it very clear that we are going to restore and strengthen the cooperation between Korea and Japan, and more importantly, a uh, reinstate and strengthen a trilateral security cooperation among US, Japan, and ROK. So New Korean government reinstated many of the under security undertakings that have had that, that had been before that had happened before rather, uh, before 2016 or 2017. So for example, the missile warning exercises are now back on. The uh, sub-ballistic missile tracking exercises are back on. And anti-submarine exercises is not back on actually, the, for the first time was exercised. It was agreed to do a anti-submarine exercises back in 2016, but it never materialized and uh, this year we uh, conducted our first anti-submarine exercises trilaterally and there are, there are many more uh, security uh, cooperation uh, undertakings and Korean government is, is going to do. And the, in the recent latest trilateral summit meeting in Phnom Penh actually these security, trilateral security cooperation featured very high in their joint statement. So this is the direction that we are going to uh, pursue. Okay, North Korea then. Okay. So I've spent that part of my diplomatic career trying to find a solution to North Korea. And you see then North Korean nuclear problem has not been solved. So I cannot say that I did a very good job of that. <laughs> So North Korea now has probably a, a workable uh, nuclear weapons capability. North Korea now has more potent means of delivery capability. North Korea is saying that they are going to you know, develop or they have already developed tactical nuclear weapons. And people say that uh, they might uh, go for a seventh nuclear as test uh, sometime this year. So all these stories are very, very negative stories. But looking back, what happened was that um, you know, Korea and the United States and the international community for that matter have made a serious attempts 
to find negotiated solutions to North Korean nuclear issue. I really do not believe that it's because of the lack of tries or lack of efforts on the part of international community uh, that uh, resulted in North Korea becoming nuclear weapons, quasi, uh, not quasi, but uh, de facto nuclear weapons country. But nuclear, North Korean leadership was very adamant in developing nuclear weapons. And unless you resort to an extreme measures, probably of military nature, it is not uh, easy to prevent a persistent uh, nuclear weapons developer from stopping the, their efforts or reversing their courses. That was exactly what happened to North Korean nuclear weapons programs. Some of you might remember the, um, the undertaking uh, called six party talks. So six party talks consist of South and North Korea, US, Russia, China, and Japan. So in other words, all those countries who are having any kind of sway over North Korea were there trying to convince North Korea the, uh, that um, it is not really wise to develop nuclear weapons. Perhaps the international community can, can provide you with an alternative future that will be more beneficial to you and to back these commitment up, the uh, all six party members uh, committed to providing North Korea with a tangible uh, benefits, uh, especially economic benefits. But that didn't uh, prevent North Korea from deploying nuclear and becoming nuclear, de facto nuclear power, nuclear weapons country. And um, so all in all, this was not a successful story, but I like to add that North Korea having developed this nuclear capability, is it, are they in good strategic position? Uh, I suppose not because North Korea will have to satisfy the basic needs of the people. North Korea needs to develop its own economy to, to sustain itself, to sustain uh, their regime. As a matter of fact, uh, back in December 2011, the current North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, became a leader. He promised two things to the people. They call it the dual pursuit of nuclear weapons and the economy. I guess Kim Jong-un probably delivered on the first part, but Kim Jong-un was far from delivering anything on the second part. So, I think North Korea's strategic position uh, is not really good. Our position is not really good, but their position is not good either. Now, the, uh, we continue to make our diplomatic efforts, however um, difficult it is, to try to convince North Korea leadership that actually we can provide you with an alternative future. And nobody really is interested in invading North Korea. And nobody is really interested in, you know, uh, the, um, the, the effecting regime change in North Korea, nobody is. But uh, we are all concerned about your the, uh, military nuclear capability. So if we can find a way to address these, these concerns of ours, and we, all of us in the international community will be willing to provide North Korea with something that you need for economic development, the uh, you know, increasing the living standards of North Korean people, and all these can be happening. Um, think about this. This year was a, a, um, a especially virulent year. North Korea fired more than 60 missiles. I mean, kind of all time high. Okay, yeah, this is a record. So this year is still out, not out yet, but um, more than 60 missiles were fired by North Korea. So 
somebody, some economist turned that into a how much money was spent on these launches. And then they come up with a figure. The figure is uh, they probably uh, spent or rather so these 60 or so missile launches will probably cost in monetary terms between 400 million and 650 million dollars. So 400 million and 600 million dollars, right? This is a lot of money. And this money, if you decide to spend this money to say buy rice, international markets, they can buy like between one and 1.7 million metric tons. That is actually three months worth of North Korean population consumption of rice. Not that I'm saying that they are consuming rice, they are more consuming maize. Maize is much cheaper than rice actually. But say South Korean people all consume rice. So let's say rice, they can, they did this, all these provocations, spending the money they could have spent on purchasing rice that can sustain North Korean, whole North Korean population for three months. So this is not a good governance by any means. And um, if international community can stay together and then do not give them money because they have nuclear weapons, at the end of the day, Kim Jong-un will have to think very seriously about which is the best way to ensure the regime survival. Uh, key firing missiles will be the best way to, to ensure regime survival, or perhaps they can come out and negotiate with the international community and give the economy a chance, uh, be a better the, uh, route for a regime survival. And in that sense, uh, in the past, we had our first agreement in 1992 with North Korea about you know, between South and North Korea, the, what they call inter-Korean denuclearization declaration. Two years after then, 1994, first agreement between US and North Korea about nuclear issue, agreed framework. 2005, the only meaningful agreement that came out of six party talks, right? At that time, North Korea claimed that they, wouldn't, they do not pursue a nuclear weapons. Instead, they, they claim that they pursue civil nuclear energy. That wasn't the case actually. So uh, what I'm saying is that um, uh, we conducted the negotiations, uh, the um, taking their words at face value uh, didn't work. So I think the game has become more fundamental fundamental, a, uh, a contest of wills, so to speak. So North Korea is trying to hold on to nuclear weapons and international community is not going to give them to, to North Korea. And um, if this continues, then what, what's gonna happen? Well, nobody knows, but I believe that um, as long as the international community can stick together and implement the United Nations enforce sanctions faithfully, then I think the strategic position of ours is not that bad. Um, and then the other things about North Korea, uh, the enhancing deterrence posture is, since that North Korea is not interested in negotiations, so my, my country, my government believes that we have to really strengthen our capability to defend our, ourselves. And there are two parts of that. And one is our own, developing our own indigenous capability called Korean version of triad. What that is, is that we are going to have a, develop a capability to, to strike if we believe, when we believe that nuclear attack is imminent, we call it Korean kill chain, which is a difficult subject to perform actually. The second one is a Korean style, the missile defense capability. And the last one is a conventional capability to uh, inflict massive retaliation should North Korea go for nuclear attack against us. That is called a Korean style massive retaliation and punishment. 
capability. This is the developing our indigenous capability. And the other part, of course, is it has to with a nuclear umbrella. And the current word for that is extended deterrence. And extended deterrence assurance is very important. And this is uh, credible. And this plays a big part in defending my country. On the other hand, now that North Korea has more potent nuclear capability, many in my country believe that we'll have to put a little more teeth into the, uh, into the extended deterrence assurance. So we want to strengthen the capability of extended deterrence. And for that, uh, we have revived very high level consultation mechanism called the EDSCG, that is Extended Deterrence Strategic Consultation Group. What that is to institutionalize Korea's voice into the decision-making process of operating a nuclear umbrella. Yes, US has an exclusive uh, the authority on nuclear weapons capability, but we believe that we, if you have that the mechanism and um, building up some kind of you know, stages of institutions by which we can voice our own opinions about this, perhaps that will make North Korean leader think twice or three times before pressing the button, knowing that Korean voices also are there in the decision-making process for a nuclear retaliation by the United States. So that's one example. So all these efforts we are doing. Oh, okay. Finally, I have to be, I'm kind of late. So I just, uh, oh, I, I shouldn't skip the human rights part. Human rights is important. And uh, we have to uh, pursue the human rights aspect of North Korea policies, whether North Korea likes it or not. The new Korean government made very clear we are going to do that. So we, you know, appointed our own North Korea Human Rights Envoy after five year absence. And we went back to uh, co-sponsoring North Korean Human Rights Resolution in the UN General Assembly, General Assembly after five years of absence. So we are doing this. And the saying to North Korea that this is something that's universally applied to all countries. And taking this opportunity, I'd like to just share with you some of the a concrete human rights concerns that we have. And one, we have six detainees in North Korea, and they are still there after five, six, seven years. We have over 500 uh, the abductees still in North Korea. We actually have 5,000, but uh, when you only count those who are abducted after the armistice, after the the stopping of the war, that's over 500, 517. And then we have over 500, we believe, those Korean uh, the, the POWs still alive in North Korea. So these are the humanitarian concerns. Also, we have separated families. We have to have reunions. They have to visit you know, their relatives and loved ones. And the time is running out on them. And these are very concrete human rights concerns. So that will, I'll just stop there about North Korea. And the final one is actually economic security, but I didn't really manage my time very well. I can't say anything. So I'll just say, say this. <clears throat> um, so this is a new area. And this has become a most important area, an exciting area for cooperation between our two countries. So for example, the two governments are cooperating say to preserve and strengthen a resilient supply chain for semiconductors, for example, we do that. Uh, same thing is happening to critical minerals, critical technologies, and also the batteries and um, health initiatives. All these efforts are possible because ROK has become a, a bit more potent economically and has something to offer on the table. And um, this, is, this is a very, very important area. And then the, the, there are big Korean businesses are making huge investments in the United States. So Samsung Electronics, huge investments for semiconductor. LG, 
huge investments on batteries and Hyundai huge investments on manufacturing, not only a internal combustion the, uh, the vehicles, but also electric vehicle in the, in the state of Georgia. So all these are happening has become very important and Korea is kind of becoming better known in American, among American people among American political community and also among, among, among American business community. So this is a, has become, I think probably the most important new area for the relationship between ROK and the United States. But I'll cover the details about this area during the Q&A time. Thank you very much for listening. The new Korean government believes that um, ROK should play an important role in the Indo-Pacific region. And ROK government understands that that, is also, that provides us with an opportunity also with a challenge. And the, um, we believe that um, the Indo-Pacific region is a lifeline for ROK in, in so many ways. And also we believe that um, we'll be, be able to be more, more active ec economically in security areas. And all you know, what is most important for new Korean government when it comes to Indo-Pacific strategy and, and other policies, other parts of the foreign policies that we believe that we'll have to uh, put values, an important part of our policies. So values are important. We have to be more vocal in human rights affairs. We have to be uh, more cooperative in building a secure and resilient supply chains. In the past, it's the question of finding a supplier uh, which can offer us the best price, right? But today it's not that. It's actually find a supplier who can be relied upon when bad times come. So in that sense, values have become a very important part of our policies. And that's why Korea has become a charter member of US initiated uh, the grouping called the IPEF, IPEF, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. And we are part of the MSP, uh, Mineral Security Partnership. And we are part of the Semiconductor Working Group Dialogue right and we are part of so many other things and also the um, uh, if uh, we believe that uh, civil nuclear energy is the area in which ROK and US actually collaborate very very productively for both countries climate change uh, the, the, the forces the world to think about nuclear energy and uh, see nuclear energy in a different light. So many countries in the world are looking at the possibilities of developing nuclear, civil nuclear energy. Now, the, that market is growing, is important and growing. This market was dominated by actually three countries and Russia, China, and France. And US was absent. Korea was, we had a small part of that market uh, building our, our four reactors in the United Arab Emirates. And the last one of which is being completed in, the, in, in uh, very soon this year. Now, see if US and ROK can collaborate in this area, I think we can have a huge com competitive edge. Korea, I think has the, one of the best manufacturing capability and experiences of building nuclear power plants. US, of course, has a huge technological capability to make this happen. So uh, this is another exciting and new areas for us. We have a number of questions that are coming in online. I know we'll have questions here in the room. Let me uh, take one of our online questions and then we'll come back to the room. So here's one online. This is a geopolitical question. This is from Hyun Park. The strengthening ties between North Korea and Russia how do you think the relations between North Korea and South Korea may change? Would South Korea take more defensive stance against North Korea's military threats or nuclear aggression? Or would they actively engage in deterring the threats through more joint military exercises with the United States, military development, and trade of conventional weapons? 
Well, North Korea is having a um, strategic, um, is uh, re reaping a strategic benefit by Russia's adventure in Ukraine because Russia and China are both backing, both supporting uh, North Korea. And that's a problem because usually uh, when North Korea, they tested nuclear weapons, we were able to get a new resolution from the UN Security Council that can only happen when these two countries do not throw the veto into, uh, into the fold. Now, the China's policy has, has always been that veto being a kind of quote unquote imperialist the, uh, means. So China, uh, what China hates most is to, 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 to be forced to throw the veto on their own. What happens is that when they know that Russia is going along with the sanctions resolution, and then China will approach us to negotiate the language of the resolution and resolution always passed each time North Korea tested nuclear weapons. Now, the, since that um, now the Russia invaded Kuwait, the, the, the Ukraine and Russia and China on the same boat and Russia actually supports North Korea uh, fully. So this kind of uh, uh, UN Security Council mechanic uh, has challenges to, to overcome. That's one problem. And our policies, ROK policies, has to be to make, make maximum efforts to make sure that our people are safe from a possible nuclear attack from North Korea. So we will do anything and everything uh, that has to be done uh, for that purpose. And we will not be shy uh, about pursuing these objectives. This is, this is why the government is in place in the first place. So we have to do, as I said, develop a, our indigenous capability to defend ourselves more quickly and more robustly because North Korean threat has become stronger. And also the, the, the United States extend deterrence commitment will have to be, will have to, will have to be remain, will have to remain credible and deliverable, uh, not by us, but by North Korea. So we'll have to have some, some policy, declar declar de I'm sorry, declaratory policies, as well as some a concrete steps to be taken to demonstrate that this extended deterrence assurance is indeed is working alive and well. So all these things we'll have to do, and we are going to do it. Thank you. Questions in the room? Yes, thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so uh, I want to ask you about extended deterrence. Um, so last month you told the South Korean correspondents uh, to Washington DC that we need a more creative way in discussing <laughs> extended deterrence. I want you to explain a little further on that part. And I want to ask you if US and South Korea should be discussing whether um, redeployment of tactical nuclear weapons should be in place. Could that be an option? I'm not asking whether we should deploy it or not, but could that be an option to discuss? This is, so two uh, questions. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is a fundamental and important question, but also a delicate question for me. When I was member of National Assembly, I did not hesitate to answer your question. I spoke my mind. They're still there in the Facebook. <laughs> but now that I came back to the government positions, so I have to be a little more cautious. But I personally, I strongly believe, I mean, all my life, I was focused upon security aspects of the diplomacy. And um, personally, I strongly believe that nothing should be off the table when it comes to security. Okay? So that's my personal belief. My government policy uh, is very clear too. My government policy or President Yoon so yeols policy is very clear. And we are not going to pursue the reintroduction of tactical nuclear weapons into Korean Peninsula. Instead, we are, we are going to pursue strengthening and you know, the extended deterrence, uh, the um, commitment assurance and apparatus for that matter. 
And when you read the, the statement that came out of this uh, extend deterrence strategic consultation group, there are many elements, a number of elements uh, that can be very important. For example, uh, the two sides agreed to strengthen consultation uh, in the issue of US, a uh, ad hoc deployment of strategic assets on the peninsula and around the peninsula. That is hugely important. In the past, when the US flew, say, B-52, okay, and that was the US decision. And our case voices actually were not there. Sometimes there, sometimes not. So no institutionalized voices. But because of these consultation mechanisms, and also this was actually um, backed up and uh, made more clear by the security consultative meeting joint statement between the two defense ministers, same thing. So what I'm saying is that strengthening the extent deterrence is the policy ROK governments is pursuing. There are many things we can do in that respect. So we have time to squeeze in one more question. Um, gentlemen over here. Uh, please. Hello. Okay. Hi, my name is Terrell Henderson. I'm a civil engineering major here. Um, my question touches on energy security. Um, you discussed uh, the Republic of Korea's uh, specialty in uh, nuclear energy. And um, I want to know if you could talk about um, the opportunity that um, within the US and South Korean cooperation, um, like what opportunities that has for um, growing renew renewable energy globally and um, ad advancing those markets, um, especially with the US being dependent on fossil fuels. Um, how do you see um, South Korea uh, leveraging this situation to um, advance uh, your own interests and build a better sustainable world? That's a very, very important question. This is about the energy and also about the climate change. And uh, we have a new, I have a news for you actually. The US has become the number one supplier of natural gas as I speak now. Actually in the past, Qatar and Australia were one and two, but US is, has become number one. And US is actually our number one supplier of natural gas, Korea's. US is Korea's number two supply of crude oil. Can you believe it? So US is big on fossil fuel, but staying on fossil, fossil fuel is not in itself, not necessarily a, a, is, is sufficient, I think. We'll have to move over to other clean energy and new and renewable energy. And I strongly believe, my government strongly believes that nuclear energy is a very important part of this, a sustainable, clean, green energy mix for any country. And that is why many of the Middle Eastern countries, including Saudi Arabia, many of the, many of the European countries, Poland, the Czech, Romania, all countries are showing interest in bringing in nuclear energy. And as I said, nuclear, United States has the best nuclear, civil nuclear technology problem is that you haven't built a nuclear power plant for yeah 30 something years after three mile island uh, big incident you built one uh, in an area between state of georgia and south carolina recently that was the first one after 30 years so us doesn't really have enough uh, manufacturing kind of acumen and experiences while my country not the uh, source of a, a kind of original, uh, the nuclear energy, but actually we have had a, we now are operating like um, 28 to 29 nuclear power plants. We built all our power, power plant ourselves. So we have had extensive experiences in building nuclear power plants. So combine these two, I think we are pretty, pretty attractive combination, you know, for, for any countries. And some of the country will think twice before, uh, you know, 
the uh, giving the contracts to say uh, Russia or China for obvious reasons, right? And so I think there is a chance in the global uh, nuclear energy market and nuclear energy being the important mix, a uh, part of the energy mix, and Korea and US working together, I think have a huge potential of um, making things better for the world. So I think it's good for my country and good for the United States too. That's why the two presidents actually uh, put in the cooperation in this area into last year's joint statement and also this year's joint statement. It's the question of all of us uh, working in the government trying to make this uh, a reality. And it's a little more complicated than I would have liked because there are questions of uh, licensing. There are questions of uh, potential commercial conflict or uh, conflict between the Korean company and American company. I'm not representing companies here. I'm, I'm representing the alliance and the government. But from, from where I stand, this is such, a, such an important area for cooperation to be missed. So I hope that we'll find a way to pursue and implement the two leaders' uh, agreement on this area. Thank you, Ambassador Cho. Now we've gone a little bit over our time, uh, so we're going to need to bring the formal part of today's discussion to a close. But I encourage people to stick around and ask Ambassador Cho your questions if he has time. Um, please join me in thanking Ambassador Cho for his. Thank you.